Given how many programming languages have been written in C over the years, it's not really surprising that we're starting to see the rise of programming languages being coded in Rust. That seems like a natural progression for the industry. So when this week's guest, Adam Chalmers, got in touch with me to say his day job was writing a programming language in Rust, I was curious and a bit envious. And I thought by talking to him, we might be able to get some tips on how you implement a programming language and how you do it in Rust specifically. But it turns out his story goes a lot deeper than that. Because the first question you ask anyone when they're creating a new language is why? What's the point? Why, what's it going to do that all the other languages in the world aren't already doing? And Adam's answer is actually very compelling. It's computer-aided design, CAD. And CAD itself isn't new. Mechanical engineers have been clicking and dragging new car designs into being for decades. But it's always been a very mouse-driven pursuit, right? You, you draw 3D models. You don't code them. You don't express them in a programming language. But you could. You could write code that defines physical things. And that's what KCL is attempting to do. And as we unpack the story of KCL, we get into tips and tricks for writing a language in Rust. We also get into dual presentation user interfaces, where writing some code shows you a 3D model, but dragging the 3D model around rewrites the code to match. And having those two things work together seamlessly is both an interesting UI design challenge and a really great example of the power of a good abstract syntax tree. In the end, programming languages, CAD, all these things are just different ways of playing with data. So let's explore the data structure. I'm your host, Chris Jenkins. This is Developer Voices, and today's voice is Adam Chalmers. Joining me this week is Adam Chalmers. Adam, how are you? I'm good. I'm good. How are you? I'm good. I'm good. You're, you're joining us as, as an Australian living in New Orleans, right? Yes, that's right. That's a big culture change. I mean, there's crocodiles back home, there's alligators over here. So yeah, it's been quite an adjustment. <laughs> very difficult. As an Australian, it's very important to have animals that could kill you nearby, right? I it's just don't feel boy. safe without them, you know? <laughs> <laughs> this is very Australian. <laughs> okay, so we, at, whilst we could talk about wildlife all day long and New Orleans music culture, we're here to talk about um, what you've been doing with computer-aided design, right? Yeah, so you know, I didn't expect we're working in an industry that had so much overlap with the hardware world, but for the last couple of years, I've been working, working with a company making tools for computer-aided design, so tools for... 3D software where you can design parts to get manufactured in the real world, not just uh, software that makes bits and moves them around the internet. This, I mean, this is obviously kind of cool in the age where you can not only design something in a computer, but eventually, presumably, you could have someone print it and post it to you all in one go. And I, I was looking at the CAD world. It seems to me it's a fair contender for the oldest non-military use of computers certainly in the top five right it's been around a long time i think so yeah the our kind of chief research guy uh alan at the company he was telling me last year in our all hands that cad software basically started by car manufacturers in france trying to actually model the curves they wanted to have in the car bodies and you know they used to all this stuff by hand with a big kind of big pencil attached to a string to get a perfect arc, but they kind of were pretty <laughs> yeah. early adopters of computer software to be able to mathematically model out the kind of shapes they wanted to carve out. It does seem like something where, especially if you're like modeling curves, Bezier splines, presumably they came up at a similar time. It makes sense, right? But you've got the enviable position of now translating this into code. Give me your exact role at your company. <laughs> So the company is called Zoo, and when I first joined them, I joined them to basically be a normal backend programmer. You know, I just saw a tweet from the CEO saying, 
we need someone to help us build a HTTP service in Rust. And I thought, well, that's what I've been doing for the last couple of years. So put up my throw my hat in the ring for that. But then when I got here, this uh, this programmer Kurt showed me a demo of something he'd been working up that he was really excited to show the leadership, which was a kind of programming environment for you write code. And instead of getting software, you get a model of your eventual hardware. And I thought that was really, really cool. And as we as a company decided to really kind of embrace that project and kind of put a lot of investment into it, uh, I found myself talking about the programming language side a lot with Kurt. And as Kurt kind of wanted to move on from writing writing parsers and JavaScript and tree execute tree walking executors and everything and get back to building this kind of UIs for you know sketching out different parts with the mouse and everything, I kind of found myself pretty naturally taking over a lot of the programming language stuff. And you've ended up in this point where you're now professionally writing programming languages in Rust. Yes. Yeah. Okay. I think I have a very I, cool job. I'm always very excited to. Uh, I'm always very ex- excited to kind of wake up and get to do do this. I think a lot of people would envy that position. Okay, so tell me about. I want to get into the guts of how you write a custom programming language in Rust. But before we get there, what is it about? Compu- I, I think about computer aided design packages, and they're very mouse driven create a square, extrude it, now you've got a cube and clicking around. When I try and think of that as a programming language instead of a mouse-driven application, I can't quite get there. So what does a language for designing these things look like? So I think you're absolutely right in that you know, most people, when they think about geometry and their CAD designs, they think visually and they kind of think with their hands to some degree. You know, you might have an image in your head and depending on how good of an artist you are, I'm certainly not a very good artist. I need to kind of <laughs> sketch it out with my hands before I really know what I'm picturing in my head sometimes. So I think that there's been, that there have been other attempts to make CAD driven by programming. There's a software called OpenSCAD where you write code and you get a model. It's a one-way process. You don't use the mouse at all. You write the code and it outputs a model. And I think the weakness of approaches like that is that people want to use the mouse. There are a lot of tools that are better done visually with a mouse. And so Kurt's big idea when he made this first prototype was that you'd be able to use both. So you can write code, and you can also use the mouse to draw whatever paths you want and to select faces by clicking them, not by storing a reference to them somewhere and having to imagine all all the 3D output in your head while you're writing code. So I think the key is to make it both code-driven and visually driven. Right. I'm trying to imagine how that's done. And my guess would be you write a programming language that converts to some kind of abstract syntax tree, then you build a visual editor of that syntax tree. And that's the way you can get both going at once. You nailed it. Completely nailed it. (laughs) (laughs) So the code is the primary representation of your model. Code is what really matters here. But then the UI is really a, like a, when you press the button to do something, it's really a macro for updating the AST, for changing the code. So when you say, click a couple of points in space to draw a line that connects mm. you know, point A to point B to point C to point A, and boom, you've got a triangle. What it's doing is it's parsed the code out, and it's got that, as you said, abstract syntax tree. And then when you click to add a point, it's updating the abstract syntax tree, adding a new item to it that represents the start of a path. And when you click the next point, it adds a new line to that co- a new node to the AST, representing the edge from A to B, and so on and so forth. And then at every point, it kind of takes that AST and unparses it or reverse parses it back up into source code. So that as you're clicking and you're adding new points, you see the code updating simultaneously with your clicks. Right, yeah. So it's all about having a parser, a pretty printer, and a UI that are all dealing with the same core data structure. Yeah, yeah, exactly. And then we also kind of store relationships between the AST nodes and the visuals. So when you highlight, you know, when you when you mouse over the code and you get your little syntax highlight and you click it, you click into a function, it shows you visually by highlighting in the in the video feed what that corresponds to. So when you mouse over 
the line, the kind of draw line call for point A to point B, the line from point A to point B also gets highlighted visually uh, and okay. vice versa. So we kind of store this data, we store this mapping between the AST and the visuals uh, so that you can understand your code a lot better. Oh, right. So you're, uh, you're keeping hold of like cursor positions as well along the way. Yeah. Uh, you mean in by the, cursor? You mean uh, like the the I'm hardware thinking, mouse cursor, or you mean like a cursor um, into a data structure? <laughs> I was actually I was actually thinking about the cursor in the text editor, like line numbers for the for the uh, source code. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So we we have like a we have what we call an artifact map that kind of links every AST node to a kind of CAD geometry that it produces, and then we also link AST nodes back to source offsets. Yes. Right. Yeah. Yeah, and then we, we just see... have like a, the code editor itself can kind of associate uh, the, the code offsets with the AST thing. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. That's um, more and more familiar from languages that want to give like good error messages and stuff. Absolutely, yeah. Yeah. Do you also store things like um, the camera angle? Because when you're looking at the model from a certain direction. That is not stored in the client. So... One little wrinkle here is that this is also uh, this is a not rendering locally, so we're uh, we're an API driven company, and so when you actually open up our app, the UI and everything is running locally, but it's connecting to a remote kind of rendering and geometry and uh, rendering engine in the cloud, and then we stream the video feed of your model over WebRTC back down to the client. Oh, so what looks like a renderer is actually just a video playing of the renderer you've got in your server farm. Yes, exactly. Why? That's a strange architectural choice. So it's it definitely has some challenges, but I think it's worth it because, firstly, uh, you don't have to, as a CAD programmer, buy this big, beefy gamer laptop that's got a big GPU and 14 fans and probably covered with garish RGB because there's no such thing as a professional graphics laptops. They're all just kind of gamer laptops rebranded. Uh, and this means that when you're rendering the model, your fans don't have to spin up. You don't have to kick into video card mode. Your battery doesn't get drained. So for the people editing it locally, it's a, you can kind of use, it's a very lightweight experience to render. I don't know if you've ever, how much CAD programming you've done, but they often tend to be really resource heavy. And so the nice thing about offloading that to the cloud is that then your machine doesn't have to render it. It just has to render a 2D video feed, which is much lighter weight. It also okay. means that you don't have to buy a new laptop when you want to upgrade your graphics card because your CAD model is getting slower. You can just, uh, you'll wake up one day and find that we've deployed you to a faster GPU whenever the, the cloud providers offer new GPUs. And so I think that's a much smoother upgrade path. So I'm going to be able to design my jet engine on a Chromebook. One day. Basically, yes. Oh, okay. yeah. And for, for professionals, this isn't quite as big of a problem. You know, if you're if you're working at, you know, like big industrial design company, your employer can probably pay to get you whatever kind of good hardware you want. Hopefully. I mean, <laughs> I think we've all had employers who are a bit stingy and won't spend, you know, the extra thousand dollars to give you a twenty thousand dollars worth of productivity improvements. But I think this is really important for hobbyists and for students especially, because if you want to you know, use CAD to do some little around the house thing, you know, make a, a hook or for your your desk or something like that and 3D print it somewhere, uh, it means that you won't have to buy a very heavyweight machine to do this kind of rendering. And so I think that hobbyists and students don't want to invest, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars into a top of line rendering workstation be very happy about it okay so you're you're doing it for those uh those cosplay people that are making their own iron man suit <laughs> that kind of thing <laughs> yeah yeah maybe i mean the other thing is that yeah when we started the company we didn't really think there wasn't the founders kind of envisioned the company as really being an api company and we realized that if we're going to be making this API, we really have to have an app that consumes the API. Otherwise, we don't know if we're going to be building the right thing. You know, if we, we have to build an app alongside the API to make sure that the API is actually useful. So right. the idea yeah. is that if you don't like using our modeling app, and you don't want code-driven code CAD thing, or even just you want to make something really specific, you can use our API to replace having to make your own CAD app. So I met a guy at RustCon a few weeks ago 
who was telling me he worked at a sheet fa- a sheet metal foundry. Okay. And they're getting orders from customers about you know I'd like to get metal you know printed with this kind of not printed metal you know cast with these kind of dimensions and curve it to this degree and this kind of alloy. And he'd have all these back and forth conversations with the customers about okay well we can't do that kind of curve. Well, we can, but it'll increase the cost by 10x. But if you're willing to make the curve a little bit smaller, you could get, you know, this much, much cheaper thing. You know, we have maximum thicknesses. There's all these kind of constraints on what okay. fabrication places can actually make. And instead of having a back and forth conversation where you have to schedule a call and you call each other back and everything, uh, they ended up making their own CAD app just for Sheet Metal Foundry, which encoded all of the constraints of that particular foundry into the app. So customers would design their thing, you know, they'd get little warnings if they were trying to do something that would be impossible. And that's an incredible amount of work to make your own CAD app with your own 3D rendering and geometry engine and everything. And so we thought, okay, there's probably a lot of shops like that, that really want to have their designers get feedback in the design step. Not when they export a model and email with someone and the person looks over it and talks to them and thinks, okay, well, here's the feedback. So, I think if companies can design their own CAD apps, you know, much easier than having to make their own full backend rendering and everything, uh, it could be very, very, very productive. Okay, that speaks to some other things we have to talk about down the line about how you're processing this AST. But let's get there via, via the detailed route. So we've got an AST. What makes it, I assume there are the standard things you would find in any programming language, like I'm a variable, I'm a function. Is there anything novel for the AST at the core of a CAD function, CAD language? I think the, not not really. I think, you know, if you look at it, the goal is to make this approachable for non-programmers. So we're trying to kind of make it, <laughs> the, the pithy summary is it's Haskell that looks like JavaScript. Okay. <laughs> so the one, I think you might be surprised by what there isn't. We don't have loops. We don't have variable mutation. It's more of a functional style language. And this is really because it's not managing a changing set of things. It's not reacting to new information or state transitions. You're really just declaratively defining a model. So there's no real need for mutation or, or loops, at least not yet. I have a couple of couple of open like avenues of research about where people might want them. Uh, so you're trying to make so you're trying to you know calculate something, you know you shouldn't have to do all your calculations by hand and then put the the final number in the the code at the end. So say you're trying to calculate you know the right curvature, maybe you just want to code the algorithm in in the the same file that you're defining the CAD model and everything. And so maybe people will want to be able to do general purpose math and that you know having a loop or loop and if statements in there would be the right way to do that. But I think you can do that all functionally as well. It's really just a question of the UX, you know, because we're going to be, we should, you know, this is the end of mechanical engineers. So we want to make sure that they don't have to take, you know, uh, a huge amount of functional programming background or anything. So we'll have to see how we go. But yeah, the, the design yeah, of the, the surface language must be quite challenging because it's a very unusual audience for programming language. Yeah, although I think the visual editor will help with that because as you can use the visuals, you'll be able to see the code being generated in real time. So my hope is that that will give people a really good intuition because they'll be able to kind of have, they'll be able to see the translation between the 3D side and the coding side as they're oh, doing yeah. it. Yeah, you see someone, you draw a curve and then you see the exact syntax of the curve drawing function. Yeah. The yeah. things that, the things really you wouldn't expect to see in other languages is really going to be the standard library. You know, standard libraries in other languages have tools like TCP stream, you know, uh, byte shuffling operations, uh, bit shuffling, or bit, bit shifting operations. Yeah. And this instead of those, we have standard library or functions like you know, circle, and you know, tangential arc and Bezier curves and things like that. Do you have to fill it, like you have to include something like a constraint solving library? in the language as well. We have some constraints on the library. We have, you know, you can constrain a line to be parallel to other lines or perpendicular to other lines or have the same angle or length or something like that. I wouldn't go so far as to say it's a constraint solving library yet. It isn't, you know, kind of like like a you know, it uh, 
I forgot the phrase, I guess, but uh, integer programming, basically, where you're going to say, you know, take this function and, you know, minimize this variable by permuting all these other variables. Right, yeah. But like goal finding type Yeah, libraries. but I do think that over time, the goal is to include more and more of these kind of constraint solvers and higher level tools. I had a really interesting conversation when I joined the company with one of the mechanical engineers on staff, Josh, where this was while we were still designing the programming language. So I opened up, you know, I opened up a text editor and said, okay, pretend this is a code editor and you've seen, you know, the code changing, but it's just a plain text editor. And I designed a function to draw a gear, to sketch out gear. And the function was par parametric and the number of teeth of the gear yeah. and the radius of the overall shape and then the height. And so this, it's kind of this fully general purpose gear function. And he was kind of blown away by that because it's pretty difficult to make CAD models really well parametric in visual editors, you know, where you can say, you know, I will not be able to update the number of teeth here and have it smoothly kind of reshuffle everything to accommodate the new number of teeth. Yeah. Or to kind of say which, which sizes are relative to which other sizes. But anyway, I got, I sketched out this outline for a parametric gear and he said, great. So as an engineer, now what I want, now that I have my fully general gear function is I want to be able to say, okay, what parameters should I choose? I can, I can put any parameter. But which parameters should I choose? I want to say, you know, get a gear that achieves a certain level of torque of torque with uh, a certain amount of cost. And so we, you know, I'd say, okay, well, you'd have some kind of function you can put in here which relates these variables to each other. And then I guess we'd have uh, a constraint solver in it, which says, you know, I, I don't know if I'm calling it, if this is what a constraint solver is. Correct me if I'm confusing two things that are wrong, but you know, having something in there which can tell you, you know, I want these parameters to be minimized, or this output value to be minimized or maximized, and so give me the right parameters for that. Yeah. And so I think once we're very happy with the state of of our app, we're going to build in these kind of engineering handbooks. You know, one of those big books where they have the coefficient of every different metal alloy. You know, exactly how. <laughs> How easy, how elastic they are, or how conductive they are, and we'd be how able much to have shearing force this metal exactly, will take before yeah. it snaps. So we'd be able yeah, to have yeah. a library of these calculations available for you, so you can easily check the model, and then say, okay, well, now I know what the value of all these parameters would be, but I don't want to choose them myself. You go and choose them. You have all the data already, so we, you know, build something in, then probably just plug into an existing solution, or if we had to make our own, not too bad, but to be able to say, yeah, what values you of parameters you should get to achieve your goals, your engineering constraints. Yeah, because this this gets into there's a lot you can do with a good physical model, like with an object as code. You should be able to say things like calculate the volume of this and how much that would cost me in platinum versus tungsten. Platinum's a terrible choice, but yeah, exactly. Exactly. So we're, we've already got some of this in our API. We have some pretty basic API analyses. So, you know, when you're, whether you're using the API or using the app, you can take your model and you can ask for you know, queries like its, uh, its mass, its weight, its um, center of gravity is the one that I was a little, little surprised by. But oh, the goal yeah. is to kind of build these up more and more and more. Before we built the sketching part of the company where you can actually design design CAD files and everything. Before that, we still had the foundation of the API. And it was pretty limited when I joined the company. What it could do is it could accept files in various formats. It could convert them or export them into other different kinds of CAD formats and it could analyze them. So you could, you know, put up a, a file you wrote in SolidWorks, you could analyze it to check the weight, and then you could convert it into a file that was appropriate for 3D printing. So right. And then you could have a script that checked in, you know, in CI, you could have a CI script that checked in changes to your SolidWorks files and recalculated the weight and would maybe fail CI if the weight increased too much. And then it would, you know, uh, be able to convert them into the right format and send them to a 3D printer for prototyping. So every time you save your SolidWorks file, you get, you know, the CI checks and then you get your uh, deployment, by which I mean 3D printing. <laughs> right. Yeah. Yeah. So the goal is to yeah. kind of build these tools and workflows for CAD. And then we kind of use that to get get the basic infrastructure or I'll service it up. And then we're like, okay, right. Now we can start also doing the design steps. 
But this is getting to a very different vision, isn't it? Because if that was API based, this is more saying there is a core data structure that describes objects and we can turn it into code and back, we can turn it into a UI and back, we can turn it into 3D printer instructions, we can turn it into an export file. Is the API going to evolve to the point where it looks almost like a refactoring tool for your AST? That's an interesting question. I think for now, the, the, the representation of the model in our app is just one possible input to our API. You know, okay. the goal is that you will be able to use our API for whatever purposes you deem fit. And if you want to use our app with it, that's great. Our app will have really good support for the API and it'll kind of be built into the UI to have easy buttons to use our API queries and everything. But there's going to be users who don't want to use our app and there's going to be users who have uh, their own really specific business needs around CAD. And they don't have the expertise in-house to bring it all in-house. And they don't want to use a general purpose tool like AutoCAD or something, which, you know, they want to be able to customize it and do just the things their business needs or bring in whatever kind of novel calculations for their field are really important. And so we want to be, we really are committed to building an API because okay. that way users can kind of plug their specific needs and have all the logic taken care of, the kind of core lifting logic taken care of by our end. And they can kind of focus on their business and their kind of domain of design. Yeah, that makes some sense. I, uh, I, I'm, I'm still wondering what I can do with this uh, core data structure that you've been making in Rust. But maybe we should deal, dig into the Rust part, right? Because I was going to say, why choose Rust? But it sounds like you'd already chosen Rust before you chose making a programming language. I think so, yeah. So the founder of the company, Jess, she previously uh, was one of the founders of Oxide, Oxide Computer, which is a big, big Rust shop. I mean, they are really programming you know, their own hardware, you know, uh, making their own firmware for microcontrollers and for okay. you know, uh, memory modules and everything. And so for them, it was an obvious choice to use Rust because you know there were kind of only three games in town, C, C++, or Rust, and only one of them uh, had any kind of memory safety. So... Rust was, and Jess kind of fell in love with Rust when she was there and had kind of gotten over the initial hump of kind of learning it and wrapping her head around the borrow checker. And so uh, we knew that this company was going to involve C++ because if you want to use graphics and, you know, if you're using NVIDIA GPUs and you want to be doing kind of fast GP operations, then you probably do want to use uh, C++ just because the Rust 3D libraries, they're, they're there, but they're not really mature enough, in my opinion, to build a productive company on. They're probably still on the hobbyist level. Uh, <laughs> You're the second but, person I've talked to this month who's dreaming of better Rust support on graphics cards. I actually listened to that podcast, few, that episode a few days ago when I was walking <laughs> my daughter around the park and I said, see, Eden, other people also <laughs> agree that we need a good Rust level support for CUDA. I'm not the only one. <laughs> How old's uh, your daughter? Uh, five months. Five months. Okay, so she, yeah, she was probably the ideal age to give that sentence to a child. Yeah, well, I could tell she really she agreed. Uh, she yeah. didn't say anything, but she's uh, a quiet type. But anyway, uh, we knew we'd be interacting a lot with C plus plus, and so we needed. Uh, but we knew we didn't want to have to write our API in C plus plus. I mean, that just seems like a bunch of uh, a bunch of foot guns ready to go off. So the goal was that C plus plus code would be in charge of doing the graphics and kind of geometry work. And then we could link that in quite nicely to Rust. And, you know, Rust and C++ have a pretty good interrupt story. There's mm -hmm. a great library called CXX that can uh, link your Rust and your C++ code with uh, no need to copy data, but just kind of make sure your data has the same representation across both languages. Oh, yeah. You... you... T tell Rust to lay things out in memory the same way C++ would, and then magically they can talk to each other without copying data. Yes. Yeah. That's an so we knew that we were going to write the API in Rust because it could nicely link with C++, but it's also got, it's one of the few languages that can kind of run the full gamut from the low level C++ code up to the high level of, I want to export a, a JSON API schema so that our uh, customers always know that 
that the API schema docs we give them are actually accurate and do reflect the servers that are running in production. Yeah. At my previous job at Cloudflare, I was kind of found myself one of the maintainers of the Cloudflare Rust API client. And it was a constant struggle to make sure that it was accurate whenever teams would change something. We'd have to open up PRs and all kinds of people trying to keep the, the API client and the API servers in a roughly compatible states. And so when I joined this company, I was very glad to see that API schema generation was a kind of first class concern. Because that makes it, sense. If you're if your business model is selling API usage, yeah. then you better make sure your API docs are really accurate. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's funny, it's it's exactly the same as you having like a code editor and a mouse based object editor. The same story, right? Get a core data structure and generate things from that. Yeah. Yeah, I say this is a job where I've become most comfortable with code generation. So how does that relate to writing, and your language is called KCL, right? How does that re relate to writing KCL in Rust? So KCL, or the kitty cat language, um, sorry, what exact, what exact well, relation? We're we're getting into the realms of code generation you mentioned, okay. but also I'm thinking like, uh, teach me how to write a programming language in Rust. Give me the yeah. basics of it. What tools do I want? So, the way I see programming languages, there's kind of four steps. You take in source code, and step one is you break it into tokens, which are kind of a higher level than just you know letters C H A R. You have you know the car keyword, and the equals operator, so. Source code to tokens, step one. Tokens to an AST is step two. Then you want to maybe transform that AST in some way. Maybe you're optimizing it. Maybe you're type checking it. Maybe you're eliminating dead code. So that AST step is uh, stage three, optimization. And then stage four is actually running it. You know, in an interpreter, you actually execute the AST. Or in a compiler, you take the AST and you generate whatever kind of lower level whether it's machine code or LLVM, whatever lower level representation you have. So we're an interpreter. So those steps roughly are we tokenize, we take the source code and break it into a, into a vector of tokens. And we use a great library called Winnow for this. Winnow. Yes. Okay. W-I-N-N-O-W. Uh, There's uh, this very much beloved and somewhat venerable Rust library called NOM which is a parser combinator library. Have you ever uh, worked with parser combinators? Love parser combinators. Oh, I, me too. I think sometimes I do advent of code just because it's a great excuse to write parser combinator libraries to parse. I don't even always solve the problem. I just like writing the parsers. There's two kinds of advent of code people. There's people who do advent of code in spite of the parsing and because of the parsing. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, I can believe that. So NOM is a... a uh, parser combinator library that's been around really, I think, very early since the very close to the start of Rust. But you know, the maintainer of it has another job and it's kind of doing other things. And so, I think NOM has become a bit of a low priority and it hasn't really received updates in the last couple of years. So, uh, we know is a fork of NOM that I think brings a lot of really nice improvements. And it's okay. kind of battle test enough that's being used in the core Rust crates, like the Tomal parsing crate, which is used in Cargo, the Rust tool the, for the Rust build system tool. So, yeah, I'm using this Bueno crate for parser combinators. Sorry, I had a question. I know. I was just so the parser combinators libraries I've used don't really make a distinction. Don't really make a distinction between tokenization and parsing. Not in the way that something like Lex and Yak back in the day yeah. did, where it was literally two separate tools for those tasks. Yeah. That's the same thing with Winnow. So in the tokenization step, I'm using Winnow to parse out uh, bytes, just UTF-8 encoded bytes, into my own custom token type. And then in the parsing step, I'm then parsing my vector of tokens into an AST. So is that something that Winnow imposes on you or just the way you've chosen to deal with the problem? It's the way Winnow. I've chosen to deal with it. In previous okay. previous pars I've written with Winnow, you know, I wrote a couple of other pauses here and there. Uh, I did them both in one step. But when I got this when I got the KCL prototype from Kurt, you say, okay, look, I've uh, here it is in JavaScript, I've translated into Rust. It's now Rust written in the style of a JavaScript programmer. Good luck, <laughs> go ahead and uh, 
rewrite it in whatever way you see fit now that there's unit <laughs> tests and everything. <laughs> so um, Peter's written the tokenizer and the parser separately, and I actually did quite like keeping them separately. Previously, I've done them together, but I think having, as a programmer, inheriting code bases, I've always rather have two simple things than one complex thing. I can see that. Yeah, persuade me, because I, I always do it in one pass. Can you persuade me to switch over to that style? Yeah, so when you are writing your tokenizer, it's a pretty simple process. You know, you generally don't have very much conditional logic. It's pretty straightforward. I think I wrote the tokenizer for KCL in one, maybe two days. Uh, but when you're writing a parser, oh, it's so much nicer to be consuming a vector of tokens because when you're debugging something, the debug output is just so much more concise because you have a debug, debug output saying, you know, I'm trying to parse, you know, car x equals four. You don't have debug output saying, I'm trying to parse C-H-A-R space equals space x equals four. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I have hit that where it says encountered the letter F when I was expecting something else. And it's like, oh, the letter F isn't that useful to me. <laughs> yeah. <okay>. Yeah. <laughs> and so the other thing is that these tokens, uh, when I say token, I'm talking about a struct with uh, fields like, you know, the source code start and end offset. So mm -hmm. you know where in the, the code edit to highlight this token. There's an error about it. Uh, the token type. So it's something like you know, keyword or identifier or operator or literal, like a number. Mm -hmm. And then it also has the underlying strings that it was pointing to. And so uh, when you're writing these parsers, it's really nice to have kind of already got this high level construct to work with. You know, your parser can say, I encountered an error, you know, between characters 82 and 84. And you can print out what was there, and you can highlight it quite nicely. And you would have to do that anyway, you know, if you were building the tokenizer and parse together. But it just means that all of your parsing functions become quite a lot simpler. They don't have to be tracking the source code offsets themselves, you know. There's a uh, whole bunch yeah. of things that have already been done for you. And sure, you're the one who did them. <laughs> they were already done by you know you in a separate in a separate module. But I think it just makes for me it's been easier to focus on just the parsing logic of, you know. Given that I've you know encountered you know a variable declaration keyword like let, what do I expect next? I don't have to think about what character I'm expecting next, but I know okay, after the word let should probably come an identifier, like yeah, yeah. Know, length of circle or something like that. Yeah, okay. Okay, next time I'm writing a parser, yeah. which probably be before advent of code twenty-four. I'll try it that way. <laughs> uh, yeah, I mean, it's. It, I, I don't think it's necessary if you're writing, you know, for a simple parser. Like if I was just parsing an advent of code input, I wouldn't do it this. I wouldn't break them in two. But for something more complex, like trying to parse an actual programming language, you know, at the point where your functions are getting long enough, you need to be thinking about how do I break them into smaller pieces. It's helpful to have all this stuff broken out, and especially for performance analysis, it's really nice to be able to benchmark my tokenizing functions, my parsing functions separately. Yeah, now okay, my parser so benchmarks can uh, just take in pre-tokenized input. And I know that any performance slowdown I see is therefore in the parser and not my tokenizing step. Okay, that's interesting. You actually are, for a young language, you're getting into the performance already. Yeah, I of mean... the compiler, I mean. Yeah, we're kind of getting into it as we need to. So, you know, we... Um, we, we we recently hired a guy to come work for us, and before he before we hired him, he was kind of our number one fan in our little Discord we have, and it was great because he was very passionate, and it was also great because he was just just maybe a little bit annoying as well because he'd say, "Hey, I'm trying to render this you know huge complicated SVG from one of my previous CAD files in your app, and it just you know completely freezes up." I'm like, okay, well. We haven't really been using it for very realistic use cases yet, and I'm not expecting it to be very very performant yet. But oh, okay, you know, I've really, I've really, you know, it would be a bad look if this, you know, still is crashing in a week's time. So let me take a look at it. So uh, he uh, he sent me this big file where he had generated. He wrote a program to generate an uh, generate KCL given an SVG file. Right. So, you know, we, we parse out the SVG file, translated all of its lines into how KCL draws lines, and then tried to run the KCL. So that was crashing. And 
at that point, I was like, okay, well, it's taking, you know, 30 seconds to, to parse, and that is clearly insane. And this is when I actually rewrote the parser. The parser has been rewritten a lot. It was JavaScript, and then Kurt translated the JavaScript into Rust and did an admirable job for someone who has not had a lot of Rust experience. Uh, and then also there's a couple of just common foot guns and string processing and Rust, you know, you're do some, doing something like, you know, calling uh, the dot, dot nth to get the nth character in a string, which has like a linear cost to it to traverse the string because you have to do the UTF-8 decoding every time. And I was like, well, uh, this smells of quadratic behavior somewhere. So it's about time I just wrote, wrote a tokenizer myself. Right. And so, yeah. I have over, to ask. Over several kind of times of, you know, hey, Adam, you know, this model is really slow and I need to show it to an investor. And, you know, we got, I got really embarrassed while pitching the app to an investor because it's slow. So here's the file. Let's fix this. And so we've just kind of been trying to take performance very seriously from the start because one of the reasons that the company was started was because existing CAD files can be really, really slow. So right, yeah. that's one that'll hopefully be one of the big selling points of the company is we're very fast. And so... I really don't want to be in a situation where we've written our own CAD kernel on the back end that is built from the ground up for CUDA and NVIDIA GPUs, and it's massively doing everything in parallel. The existing CAD kernels have to do single-threaded, and to have that sitting around at completely ridiculous levels of utilization, because my little Wasm, uh, my little Rust code that's running in, a, in Wasm in the browser is just doing all the string processing to process the program to know what commands to send. That yeah. would be a little embarrassing for me, so I've tried to uh, ensure that doesn't happen. Yeah, and you must be under quite serious time constraints if you're expecting people to write code, you send it to the back end, render it, turn it into video, get it back to the front end in presumably tens of milliseconds. Yep. But parsers are pretty fast, you know? Uh, it's it's one reason I think using Rust is a great choice for the company. If you care about performance, it's really just nice to have Rust across the whole stack. You know, uh, think uh, I think I was watching an interview with uh, Richard Feldman, possibly on this podcast actually, where he was saying, yeah, well, you know, I wanted to write Rock and Rust because I didn't want to write it in a, a nice easy language and then hit the performance ceiling and have to rewrite it in Rust anyway. Just use the fast language from the start. I remember him saying that. Yeah. <laughs> Okay, so um, I'm thinking, so, can I get any other Rust tips out of you so, here? I mean, we, we, we got we got tokenizing, and then parsing is pretty similar. I don't know. We can kind of keep going through the, the programming language stack, or we can switch into more of the Rust stuff. Um, I, now, I, want, I was going to ask you next, um, any quick tips for, because you've got to pretty print the AST back out into Rust. Mm -hmm. Are you using anything interesting for that? Not yet. We're currently just using, basically the AST is pretty naive. It is what you would expect from, you know, your first, your first kind of interpreter. You know, we have AST nodes, they're all stored, you know, they store pointers into the heap to other API nodes. So to traverse the tree, you have to follow pointers along the heap, and that's not great for cache locality. But, you know, again, given what you said about Everything is kind of being sent over network to the back end where it's rendered into 3D and then we send the video back. Luckily, you know, by the time we're talking about overall latency for the app, we're talking about the order of milliseconds for transmitting video over the internet. And so I haven't needed to go so far as to really optimize like the cache locality and make sure I'm stack allocating everything yet. Right. <laughs> I do expect there will come a point because as people do more and more and more calculations within KCL itself. You know, say you want to cal calculate the curvature of your shapes in the math that KCL gives you. At that point, that will be an entirely local calculation. We don't, you know, we want to make sure that if you're doing, if the bulk of your app is doing local calculations, it'll be fast enough. But I'm trying to not get too seduced by interesting looking performance problems that are kind of sitting in the ocean on a nice big rock calling out to me. <laughs> Just focus on yeah. currently what is the slowest thing. Let's attack that um, you know we try not to make dumb performance mistakes you know if there's an easy way to make it faster at the moment i'm not going to wait until it's a problem later down the line to fix it but you know uh the ast basically as you uh, the the unpausing everything is pretty straightforward you know we have the ast 
we traverse it, you know, doing standard tree traversal and kind of building up, building up a string as we go. Hmm. Do so, you, you know, keeping track of the indentation depth of each node and, you know, each node kind of outputs some strings and it knows how indented it should be. And at the end, it kind of goes through and produces the, the a nice big string. Right. Okay. Do you, um, before we leave that specific part, do you optimize like differences or do you reparse the entire file every time someone changes it in the editor? Great question. Right now, we just reparse the entire file because the parser is fast enough. You can just do that in every keystroke and it's not too big of a problem. Okay. But again, I expect that as people build larger and larger and larger programs in KCL, it will get eventually to be a bit of a problem. But honestly, I mean, the parser is very fast. Parser combinators really do compile down to quite efficient code. They're, you know, when you're using these higher level Rust constructs like iterators, I find that the compiler can often give you really nice optimized code because it knows this isn't just a general purpose for loop that could be jumping anywhere and doing anything inside it. I know that you know I'm traversing every single item in this vector exactly once, and therefore I can do nice things like elide the bounds checks that would otherwise have to do to make sure right. that you know when you're indexing into the array, it's always a valid element of the array. It knows at the start that you're going to do every element of your array exactly once, so it doesn't have to do balance checks. So, you know, Rust makes this kind of list processing stuff quite efficient. Mm. Yeah, as you would hope, right? Yeah. It has that kind of, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. There's, so, you know, luckily, there's a lot of really good Rust stuff out there for building programming languages, because there's a really successful programming language written in Rust that I really admire. Um, and so I can borrow a lot of the tips from that team. Which one's that? Oh, it's Rust. Oh, Rust is written in Rust. Yes, <laughs> I didn't know that. How did I yeah. not know that? Yeah, it's a uh, it's, uh, Rust is written in Rust, and so you know when I go to RustConf, I can kind of go and get coffee with people who work on the you know Rust's own parsing tools and everything, and I can you know they'll say things like, oh, you know, you really shouldn't be you know doing all these heap indirections. We you, you know we built this library for Rust analyzer called Rowan, and it kind of takes your tree structure that's nested on the heap and it kind of packs it up nicely and efficiently and puts it all into one flat thing on the stack and then you can traverse it nicely. So I get oh, these kind of nice yeah. performance tips from really big languages written in Rust. Right. So Rust itself has been optimized for writing languages. I guess so, yeah. 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 That's interesting. That makes me wonder why it doesn't have its own built-in parser combinator library or like official one at least. Hmm. I think Rust is one of those languages where they try to have, relatively speaking, a relatively sparse standard library because they take their one, you know, Rust one point oh promise is that we will never break code when you upgrade Rust, and so therefore the standard library can never change its API. So, if they include something like a parser combinator library in the standard library, then they can't ever really change the API for it. And I guess right, people yeah, making yeah. Rust just didn't feel like they were experts enough at parser combinators to be able to say, for the next 20 years, this API will remain stable. <laughs> OK, yeah, yeah, fair enough. But okay, breaks, in that case, third-party library can you take you know, release version 2 or 3 or 4 or 5. Yeah, needs. different set of promises, right? Yeah. OK, so take me down the stack a little further then. So we get into your evaluator. And it is you're interpreting you're not compiling at this stage, right? Yeah. Yeah, it doesn't really make sense for KCL to be compiled because it would be kind of compiling with massive scare quotes there into uh, API calls to our API. And so, you know, we might, you know, kind of compile it down to bytecode for our own little custom purpose, little bytecode machine, which I, I did try to write at some point and kind of spent a month or so trying that and I was like, right, this is really proving to be more work than I think it's going to be worth and I should <laughs> really just cut my losses here and make the existing interpreter faster rather than having to rewrite everything. So yeah, it's an interpreter language. Uh, and I think if anyone's trying to write their own language, I would say start with an interpreter because you don't yet know what kind of instruction set to target. You know, you might want to, uh, firstly, we, we run KCL uh, in this app I've described which is a web app. You can either kind of load it in a browser, or you can download an Electron app where 
you know, it can do things like read files and save them to your file system locally and stuff like that and save your preferences. But you can also use KCL via CLI if you don't want to do, well, you know, if you don't want to open up a web browser or a GUI. And the downside is you don't get this nice bi-directional visual stuff that I've been mentioning to you. You know, there's no curves you can move around. But if you're, you know, more comfortable, you know, writing all your code in Vim and having a little CLI to output it, which I often do for my own little testing purposes and testing other language, I'll just have a little text editor in the left half of my terminal. On the right half, I'll have a little watcher script that when I save the file, it runs it through our zoo CLI and it parses it executes it and outputs it to a PNG file on disk and then displays the PNG in my terminal using my terminal's little image capabilities. Oh, uh, okay. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah, you... the, it's an interpreter. And this means that uh, we can kind of take our, our Rust code and we can compile it into x86 for me to run locally on my, on my laptop. Oh, well, actually, it's ARM. It's uh, compiling to ARM64, because I'm on one of these new shiny MacBooks. <laughs> uh, and then in the browser, we run it via WebAssembly. So having the interpreter gives us a lot of flexibility for that, because otherwise we have to figure out you know, how we're going to target x86 and ARM and WebAssembly. So, yeah. Yeah, OK. What? Tell me a bit about running it as WASM. Was that straightforward? It was relatively straightforward. There are some problems. So hmm. when you compile your code to WebAssembly, it's then very easy to interoperate it with JavaScript. You can take your Rust code and you can output a WebAssembly library and a little uh, JavaScript module loads it. There's a tool called Wasm Pack that does all this for you. And it not only compiles your Rust to JavaScript, but it all to uh, WebAssembly, but it also makes the little JavaScript modules you can really easily import it to your existing JS code bases. Right. Uh, or TypeScript or you know whatever version you're using. The problem is that WebAssembly is great because it's a very kind of tightly controlled and sandboxed environment. It doesn't have access to your core machine. It can't you know, read your file system and do whatever system calls you want and so you can control it very nicely. The downside is that then that means you can't actually do everything you want. So you can't, for example, make network requests from uh, WebAssembly very easily. So what we do, you know, this means we can't really use the kind of standard web handling stuff we can do when we compile our KCL executed to the CLI. Mm -hmm. So instead, uh, Basically, you take these functions in Rust that are doing network I.O., and when they get compiled down to WebAssembly, the WebAssembly is basically calling out to whatever uh, managing program is actually the runtime for your WebAssembly. In this case, it's the browser. And so it says, the WebAssembly says, hi, browser, I would like to send this information over the TCP socket. And the browser is actually then taking that, and it's going to do the do that request with its own built-in browser networking stack. So doing whatever kind of equivalent of an of a HTTP browser fetch or something, and then paste that data back into the WebAssembly virtual machine. And it says, right, you, uh, yeah, you sure did that networking all by yourself, little guy. Congratulations, <laughs> here are your bytes. So this means that some Rust libraries you expect to work just fine for x86 or ARM, do not work when they're compiled to WebAssembly or they need special support for it. So um, you have to enable like a special JS or WASM flag in your library and then it knows, okay, you know, if I'm running locally, just make a normal system call to the whatever Linux, you know, whatever the operating system's TCP stack is. But if I'm running WebAssembly, then instead call this kind of standard WebAssembly interface for handing off IO to the, the runtime. Right. So you end up, I've done this with uh, some embedded stuff. You end up with doing that dance of enabling and disabling library feature flags in cargo.toml. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. And I ran into okay. this just the other day. And it's generally pretty straightforward, but it does sometimes lead you to kind of just Google the library name and WASM and figure out how <laughs> yeah. to get it all to work together. Yeah, I imagine support for that generally across the Rust library ecosystem is getting better and better, though, right? It's, it's very, very, thing. very good. I'd say Rust is probably the probably the best language to target WebAssembly in. Just the compiler support for 
targeting WebAssembly is really, really, really good. And because WebAssembly, you know, doesn't have garbage collection and stuff like that, people have, uh, uh, you know, yeah. pe previously people wanted to compile Go or Python into WebAssembly. They had to also compile the whole runtime to manage all these uh, objects and garbage collection and, you know, threading and concurrency things. And that's totally fine. It just means your WebAssembly blob is then going to include not only the code you want to run, but all the code for running that code. And so yeah, from the start, yeah. people have been using Rust for Wasm because... It kind of compiles down really, uh, really small. You don't have to try and do bring a, a whole native uh, green thread, multi-threaded concurrent executor stack. Yes, yeah, I'd not thought of that, but that does explain why Rust is particularly popular in that space. Yeah, and the same thing for embedded. You know, you can. Uh, yeah, basically with Rust, a lot of things are built into the language, and other languages are just kind of standard library ecosystem things. Uh, sorry, I shouldn't say standard library. I mean, uh, common libraries. And the downside of this is that, as you say, well, it's not the standard library. Maybe it should be. But the upside is when you're targeting, you know, one of these more constrained platforms like Embedded or WebAssembly, you don't have to bring this massive, massive, massive language runtime with you. You can choose to bring a smaller one, a smaller library that's perfectly scoped to the task you're doing. Yeah, yeah, that that makes a lot of sense, especially on the web, right? Where you you do you don't want to over optimize download size sizes, but you don't want to force your user to download an entire package ecosystem either. Yeah, especially yeah. if one of your customers is say I don't know in Antarctica and they get you know several hours of internet per day and they're you know carefully <laughs> portioned out between all the different uh, different people in the lab. Okay, well, that gives me a link because I wanted to get back into your user space, actually. Mm -hmm. So if you've, got, if you've actually got users in, in Antarctica, what, how does that work with your very much thin client, thick backend server cloud model? Because surely, I mean, the speed of light from New Orleans to San Francisco, fine. Speed of light from Antarctica and back, that's a bit laggy. <laughs> Yeah. So as you pointed out, the latency is a big part of the concern of the company, especially again, if you're building yourself as really fast CAD, then it's really important you get that latency down pat. Mm. So the biggest thing we can do to affect latency is deploy the app to a region near the user. Right? So <laughs> Okay, yeah, I've got to ask, is there AWS Antarctica? <laughs> <laughs> there's uh, Antarctica Web Services, but I don't think that's what you would know. There's not. That oh. would be silly. <laughs> Someone should um, do that. No. No so, server calling no. required. Yeah. So obviously for most users, the most important thing we can do is to deploy the app near them geographically. Mm. And that is straightforward enough for us to do because we can deploy the app really just anywhere there's a GPU. And, uh, you know, even if we, you know, we've kind of built this to be multi-region from the start. So that we don't have to have everyone in the world connecting to San Francisco. And the nice thing is that Kurt, who uh, started the language and the app and everything, he was the first extern first hire for Zoo. Mm. And he's in Australia. So all the rest of the team were in Los Angeles, and he was in Australia. So the latency from there was uh, really, you know, from the start, we had to build it so that the app could work <laughs> without crossing the entire <laughs> ocean. You know, we, the very, very, very first yeah. prototype we deployed on our CEO Jess's laptop, and we were using it remotely. And then Kurt was trying to use it from Australia. Anyway, but as you point out, what do you do if you're in Antarctica or, I don't know, in so, uh, anywhere else with uh, really high latency internet? So we're fundamentally API-driven. There's never, I think, going to be local video rendering. But I think what's very likely is in the future when we have you know enterprise customers that you will be able to self-deploy the app on your own infrastructure. And it will still be communicating over network, but that network will be you know, your office internet or local host or something. Right. So I think okay. in the case of Antarctica, we would, you know, if we had a customer there who was uh, like wanted to work with us, we would probably let them download new binaries, which contain the engine that they could deploy locally and they could connect their clients there and have all the data kind of going within, you know, within their Antarctica office. Okay, so you so you could foresee going for that dual model where it's mostly in the cloud. Yeah, yeah, I think a lot of companies do. You know, that they, they 
they run in the cloud and for enterprise customers, you can download the binaries and you can self-host them in whatever way you want. And that way you have, you know, so you keep all the data kind of flowing within your own network and you're not sending out data to arbitrary parts of the internet. And there's, you know, legal compliance reasons and security reasons you may want to do that. But I think that will, we haven't built that yet, but there's nothing stopping us from, like all, all we would have to do is just send someone a binary. It's really more, I think, of a, I think the the legal side of that would be more difficult than the technical side. And we'd have to have some kind of contract to give people and like documentation about how to deploy it. But theoretically, as long as you've got uh, an NVIDIA RTX GPU on your machine, we could send you the binary and you could self host it. I think yeah. it's very likely we do that in the future. We just have not yet had a customer who that's their deal breaker yet. So. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, I can see the the legal and business and sourcing graphics cards reasons probably trump the technical ones, right? Yeah. I mean, the graphics cards things are interesting because if you've been following all this kind of graphics cards and parallelism stuff going on, which I know you have, there's a it's all very data driven and ML driven right now, and yeah, you know, massive parallelism of uh, scientific calculations. But we're actually using GPUs in a pretty old school way. We're using GPUs to render graphics. <laughs> which <laughs> How vintage of you. <laughs> yes, it's it's a it's very retro. It's quite polka dot. Um, but this means that a lot of these new shiny fangled uh, data center GPUs that they, they don't support graphics API. So you, they don't even have uh, you know an HDMI port in a lot of these new graphics cards. Hang on, hang on. You're saying there are graphics cards that don't do graphics. <laughs> <laughs> um, the world is broken. So, well, yeah. So you know, uh, I'm pretty sure that uh, you know, I'm pretty sure that Cloudflare's uh, GPU offerings, where you can run your code on their data centers, really close to the user. I'm pretty sure they only support compute shaders, which are shaders that kind of do all the numeric processing, and they don't do actual graphics rendering for pixels in those shaders. So, I mean, the dream would be that someone like Cloudflare says, "Yep, yeah, you can now." run your code on any of our GPUs really close to your users. And we operate in 150 data centers around the world. Whatever. I used to work at Cloudflare, so they're always kind of somewhat top of mind for me. But <laughs> they, I don't think they actually offer graphics rendering in their uh, in their GPUs or their GPU offering. I think it's only for kind of doing low latency ML or data processing. Oh, that's strange. Yeah. So I we're in this place there's where some like, gaming angle for them there that they would have taken advantage of. Yeah. Well, I think I think just when it comes to cloud GPUs, like cloud gaming is uh, nowhere near as big of a market for NVIDIA as kind of cloud massively parallelized matrix multiplication stuff. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, I'm thinking of Google Stadia, which tried and failed to make that happen, right? Yeah. Stadia was actually a big influence for us in terms of how we're doing this cloud rendering our app is much more like cloud like a cloud gaming thing if you think about it you know we're trying to let the user move the mouse to pan the camera and we want to keep it happening at a smooth 60 fps so it's actually not Uh, dissimilar at all to cloud gaming strategies yeah yeah i could see that yeah so streaming back the video fast enough that it looks like you moved the mouse and did something locally yeah that's reminding me of a game. Have you heard of the game Factorio? I have heard of that game, yes. Where, where you build like pipelines of it's very nerdy, very logistics core nerdy. My wife and I were up late last night playing Satisfactory, which is kind of oh. like a 3D Factorio. <laughs> right, yeah. The Shapes is another nice one. But, um, yeah, the, 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 the lines being blurred between... There's also like power wash simulator, things that blur <laughs> the lines between doing work and playing games. Yeah, I've often tried to tell people thing. like Factorio is like all the fun parts of programming without the boring parts, like sitting down <laughs> and talking with your stakeholders about you know where this green science cube is going to go next. And, oh yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, my wife uh, discovered she loves these factory games. And she's always said, I think I would have made a good programmer because I love doing math in school, but no one ever encouraged me because, you know, in the, in the nineties, programming was not cool and women were not usually encouraged to give it a try. And then when she sat down and got totally addicted to these factory games, like I was, I realized, yep, absolutely. She's got a programmer's brain. (laughs) Yeah. 
Yeah. The joy of optimizing pipelines. Yep, you're yes. one of us. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Okay. So the goal is that people will basically not be able to realize that the rendering is happening remotely. And we're trying to be clever about it and keep the latency down. But the goal is to really have it be low latency enough to feel local. Does that mean... I've, now I've never dug into WebRTC, but is, is it something like UDP in which you're kind of dropping packets if they don't arrive in time because the newer packet's more relevant? Absolutely. Yeah, that's yeah. that's how WebRTC video transmission works. WebRTC is a really complicated protocol. And to be honest, it's a little bit of overkill for our use case because WebRTC basically says, right, UDP has solved the problem of transmitting video packets around the internet at low latency. It's everything else on top of that. Like, how do you manage if someone joins a call or leaves a call? And how do you manage in a peer-to-peer -peer way all these people on the call sending video to each other without all going through a central server? And we are, in fact, actually just a central server for the video. And so we're sending it back down to peers on the internet. So WebRTC is definitely a bit of overkill for us. But it just happens to be, you know, the kind of primary way to send video live video over the internet if you're sending a video file there's more uh, there's easier ways to do it but if you're live streaming even if it's from a central server down to an individual user that doesn't have their own you know nat problems and everything web rtc is the way to go for now right. and the nice thing is that then in the future if we wanted to add in you know multiplayer basically to our cad editor and have oh, people yes, joining the course. session and collaboratively editing each other then we have a uh, video that kind of accommodate that quite nicely yeah yeah that makes sense you yeah throw in the video chat as well as them fighting over who gets to move the mouse at the moment yeah i'd say it's more you know we can easily accommodate like live streaming the same model to both people rather than having you know their webcams too but absolutely the webcams too the tricky okay. thing actually has been that um web rtc and udp like you point out give you the low latency of transmitting video but we actually, we need to make sure that the mouse click events and the mouse drag events are also really low latency. It doesn't matter if the video is really low latency. If your mouse, you know, you drag the mouse and then a second later, the model starts moving. Yeah. So we've been obviously using UDP for the mouse movements and everything. And uh, a nice yeah. thing about WebRTC is that there are both, there are kind of media channels you can add in WebRTC for streaming video. And there's also data channels. And these oh, really? data channels are very much like WebSocket, except you can configure them to be, you can configure them to trade off reliability and uh, latency. So you can configure a WebRTC data channel, which can send text or binary, to be more like a WebSocket or more like UDP. And you can kind of trade them off in different ways. So we send mouse events that need to be really low latency. And it's also, okay, if, you, know, you drop a mouse event because, you know, if you're smoothly scrolling across the screen, it doesn't matter if mouse event, you know, the 28 out of 30 milliseconds gets dropped because the one at 929 will come through. So we send those over UDP managed by, uh, by WebRTC, and then WebRTC manages, you know, the process of getting these UDP datagrams over the internet with a minimal amount of uh, retransmission and reliability and a maximum amount of throughput and latency there. Yeah. Right. I didn't realize that was built into WebRTC. Does that, but the what about the, the code changes? Are they going over HTTP, WebSockets, or so the code, the, All the code stuff happens locally. So when you have the when you have the app open, the kind of KCL, the language, is entirely happening within your local session. It compiles oh, okay. down to this executor that's running locally, or sorry, it gets interpreted locally, and then we're basically making WebSocket calls. So every time you run a KCL standard library function, like you know, line line from X1, Y1 to X1, X2, Y2, mm. uh, that is actually making a call over the KiddieCAD API saying, you know, add line to V from these points to those points. And that's being sent over a WebSocket. And that you know is using you know WebSocket, so it's reliable. It's TCP. It's doing retransmission and checksums and all those nice things. Right. Okay. That gives me that gives me the networking protocol stack. There's one, perhaps there's one large topic to move on to. It's the last big thing on my mind, and I don't know if it's the present or the future of what you're doing, but 
I'm thinking about your language and thinking of all kinds of different checks you can do on this data. Like you can check if it's physically viable. You can do static typing checking to see if the code makes sense. You can do um, type, like we said earlier, type checking that not model checking for how much is this going to cost me versus how long is it going to take to manufacture? What kinds of checks do you have of the model data now and what are you planning? Right now, we have really, we don't have kind of checks in this way built into the editor or anything. We have mm -hmm. a couple of API queries you can make, like you can, you know, send your model, uh, uh, you know, you can, you can send your query for, you know, what's the, the weight or the mass or the center of gravity of it. But absolutely, we are like so excited to build this kind of linting or system that we're going to call. You know, I saw a thread on Twitter a few months ago from a mechanical engineer who was saying, you know, I just got sent, you know, I just downloaded this design on Thingiverse for, you know, some part. I don't remember. It was like a, you know, some kind of case for holding something. And he went through as a mechanical engineer and talked about all the mechanical problems with it. He's saying, you know, this groove here is too thin to be manufactured by 90% of the different blades. So you'd have to get a really specialized blade if they just made this larger, this purely decorative element larger, you'd be able to manufacture it so much more easily in a range of machines. This uh, edge here is just like a complete hard, sharp edge that's going to be really unpleasant for anyone to hold. It's going to kind of dig into them a little bit. It should really be filleted away, kind of smoothed away. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah. And so there's all these things that mechanical engineers know to look for manually when they look at a model. And we are absolutely going to make as many of them machine checkable as you can. So just static analysis for yeah. code, but static analysis isn't saying, you know, Hey, you're doing, uh, you know, you're using a slower method here than you should, you know, you're, you're, you're pausing this UTF-8 uh, into a string that you can actually operate in the robots directly. We're going to have the same thing saying, Hey, this tolerance here you've selected is, you know, very unlikely to be supported by the range of machine shops. You know, you should really, if you can remove, you know, make this tolerance larger or something like that. That's yeah, yeah. I can see lots of applications for that. Like three D printers, you've got your overhang is too high. High, it's going to topple over on the printing plate if you don't adjust it. Exactly. Yeah, we but are. What would that take? Because is that? Do you actually have to get into like modeling the effects of gravity on the object? We are going to. I mean, one nice thing is that on the back end, we have. Uh, there's two kinds of ways to represent 3D. There's what's called right. visual representation, or VREP, which is basically triangles, right? It's, you know, you store just points and edges between them, and generally you can make whatever triangles you need, and that's really good for rendering graphics really quickly. But right. it is not yeah. really able to understand the physics of the model because you've approximated your model as just triangles. You know, if you look at a a bottle like this that cannot be represented easily or accurately as triangles. It actually has circles and curves. This and is so the thing where if I curve... fire up Blender and zoom in too far, it all starts to look very janky. Exactly. So people yeah. often say, well, why are you pulling this? Didn't, doesn't Blender already can do what you want? No, Blender is fundamentally, <laughs> you know, it might look good, but you cannot use it to do manufacturing analysis. So we had to build a kernel using boundary representation or BREP, which actually stores, as you said, the Bezier curves and things like that understand the geometry. So the goal is to basically have in the engine, we keep an accurate enough model that we can do analyses on it. And we can then send those analyses back to the front end and it'll you know put them at the right places in the code or there'll be a little pop-up panel for a model analysis, whatever. We haven't yet built that. We're still kind of really heads down trying to get the core CAD workflows ready so that all the all the buttons users expect to see when they open up their existing CAD software will be in our app too. But absolutely, it's something we're like very excited about because there are so many checks which require a human being to kind of look over a model and mm. just kind of use their expertise. And that's great. But imagine if programmers had to do that every single time. Like the whole insight of the software industry for the last 50 years has been that we can use these, you know, we're adding software. So make the software better. So, you know, keep improving the software with more expert analysis of how to write good software. 
and don't require human discipline every single time. You know, that's why we use newer languages that have balance checking for arrays. We don't constantly make the same mistakes over and over again. I'm a big believer that, uh, you know, the, the reason I think this language is going to work out is because humans are really good at so many things and machines are really good at like exhaustive detail and analysis. And to be able to marry those two together is going to make something much stronger than either of them separately. To have a machine look over every single edge in a model and say, hey, this one in the very back like thing here, that is not filtered. And that's going to be really hard to manufacture that human could miss. But if yeah, you have yeah. your model stored as code that, that computers can reason about, uh, I think everything's going to become much more, uh, much easier to analyze with the machine. And this will probably mean we have to build something that understands the specifics of, you know, is this being 3D printed or is this being modeled, you know, cut away with a, a CNC machine or some other yeah. kind of manufacturing thing. And like I said, you know, I think engineers have these big books of different coefficients of materials and everything. So we're definitely going to build material analysis. So it knows this isn't just a, a cube of this size. It's a cube of this size made of this particular alloy, this ma particular set of blades in a machine shop. Uh, and so I'm really excited to add that kind of information into the AST. Right, yeah. Um, we yeah. haven't gotten so, there yet, but uh, yeah, I'm very, very, very excited when we can start doing that. <laughs> definitely going to, the goal is to really, you know, right now the app is just for uh, designing your 3D models, but the goal is that, you know, you will be able to press Control P and print it to either a 3D printer or a CNC machine or whatever kind of manufacturer, send it to a manufacturing shop in this kind of nice machine format. And like I said, that sheet metal foundry that made their own CAD app to kind of encode all of the design constraints. The goal is to have all those kind of design constraints available in the app so that you don't have to call up the machine shop and say, you know, tell me what my, like, what do you think about my model? Like, is it easy to manufacture that, you know, the app will be yeah, able yeah. to give you that feedback in real time in the design step so you don't have to go and uh, send off your model somewhere else? Yeah. I could even see a future in which it tells you which of the different manufacturing options would be the best one to get a good result, right? This yeah. is the kind of thing you really ought to 3D print. It just makes more sense. Absolutely, says, yeah. Says the computer, yeah. Yeah, you know, that knows if you make a bunch of really small features here, that the 3D printing will be easier. But if you need this kind of high fidelity of these kind of particular curves that aren't easy to 3D print because the printer is going to voxelize it, then you should yep. be using a CNC or something for that. And hopefully in the future, it can then tell you what kind of machine will be best and then even point you to, I mean, this is the dream, is point you to machine shops around the world that have an, have an API that will accept these 3D files and partner with us to get work sent to them straight from the app. Oh, yeah, yeah. And they'll be able to say, this shop is the one closest to you that has you know, the, right, the right balance of close to you and has capacity at their lab and has the right kind of machine and has the right kind of blades to do everything right. Yes. Do you know, I've got a friend who works for a company that does robots that assemble circuit boards, mm. who we must get on the show one day. I could see a future in which you just send off your file and it automatically goes to here for the circuits and there for the casing and it just shows up as a finished product that you designed. That would be great. very cool. That would yeah. be very cool. Okay, that's the future and maybe that's a good point for you to leave us with. Give me, a, I want a couple of suggestions from you for links for the future. Where should I go if I want to learn how to write a programming language in Rust? And where should I go if I want to play around with KCL? So I think if you want to learn to write a programming language, the best thing that I've found is a book called Crafting Interpreters. I've heard of that one. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. I When I kind of started taking this project seriously, I thought, okay, well, I've really got a, you know, this is actually going to be a core part of business now, and I've got a kind of, I did not have any kind of experience making a programming language before this, so I thought, okay, <laughs> I've kind of just happened to be the person here with the most strong opinions about programming languages, I guess. So I really got a upskill. <laughs> so really strongly recommend that book. And it's written kind of targeting Java, but it's pretty straightforward to translate that into whatever language you want to use. And because it's it's such a well-loved book, there's a lot of uh, examples where people will share the code that they've written. So well, crafting interpreters kind of starts by defining a pretty simple language called locks, and then it helps you 
write a, an interpreter for locks and bytecode VM for locks. And right. these are both written in Java in the book. Sorry, in the book, the first is written in Java and the second is written in C. So two examples of different languages. And it's pretty straightforward to translate the C into Rust if you're familiar with Rust. But the other thing is because this book is fairly well loved, you can go online and you can find all kinds of people's implementation of these locks. Uh, uh, interpreters nice. or VMs in different languages. So basically any language under the sun, you can find someone's code who's read through this book and see their implementation. There are, you know, several different Rust implementations of locks. Oh, that's a nice resource. Yeah, okay, I'm linking to that in the show notes. Yeah, and if someone do. wants to play with your work specifically? They can go to zoo.dev. And that's our, they can download the modeling app and it's uh, it's free and they can get started and they can... Uh, start using KCL to make their models or use uh, the mouse-driven UI to make their KCL to make the models. Oh, nice. Mouse-driven computing from a different yeah. angle. Yeah, yeah. What if the mouse was actually good for programmers? Yeah, yeah. And actually generated real source code rather than some drag-and-drop blocks. Yeah. Yeah, um, interesting. And I also blog about programming, so if people want to check my stuff out, they'll, they can go to uh, adamchalmers.com. Cool. I will link and, to all of those in the show notes. Yeah, it's got you know little bits and pieces from me and links to other places to find me. Cool. Adam, time for you to go and uh, put a physics engine inside your not really a game honest. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, time for me to actually get started with work for the day, not just talking about it. <laughs> Awesome. Thanks so much for having me on, Chris. This is so Absolute much fun. Absolute pleasure. Cheers. See you again. Cheers. Thank you, Adam. He's a lucky man, isn't he? Getting paid to write a programming language? That doesn't really happen. I think it's the first time I've heard of that happening outside of academia, where the pay isn't great, or banking, where the pay is great, but money isn't going to be your biggest problem. So, yeah, I think I'm a little bit envious of you, Adam. Good luck. And I'm looking forward to seeing the world's first type checker that has a notion of weight and density. That'll be interesting. While we wait for that to come along, there are links to all the libraries and a few of the games we mentioned down in the show notes. I hope you enjoy them. If you enjoyed this episode, please take a moment to click like if you're watching it on YouTube or rate it, review it, heart it, star it if you're catching this on one of the podcast apps. We'll be back next week with more, of course, so stay tuned. Make sure you're subscribed, and I will see you then. I've been your host, Chris Jenkins. This has been Developer Voices with Adam Chalmers. Thanks for listening.